midst of its greatest years of prosperity. And kids, lots of them, born in prolific numbers, were the real focus of the society. Groveton was among the first of 50 new schools to be built in just 10 years by Fairfax County to accommodate the post-war baby boom generation. Only 20 years after its mid-50s opening, the school moved to a new location and soon after merging with another local high school, even the name Groveton High School itself disappeared like a bubble bursting in the frantic growth of suburbanization. Nearly 40 years after opening, 560 Groveton graduates returned to the old school on a hot August afternoon in 1995 to celebrate a reunion of the classes of 1957 through 70, Tiger Jubilee. Choral director Mrs. Tabor didn't practice all the music of the era, some of which was heard later that night at a dinner dance in Alexandria. This memento of the 1995 all-class reunion of Groveton High School is both a record of the past and a reflection on the changes in our society as the baby boom generation enters its own 40s and 50s. A few years ago. The school was uh, unfinished kids that left Mount Vernon High School, they split the school in half. And there was a dividing line, which if you lived on one side of the line, you stayed at Mount Vernon. If you lived on the other side of the line, you went to Groveton. So they asked a group of the kids who lived on the Groveton side of the line, would you like, help, like to help open the school? Uh, the reason being that the monies had run out after construction, and a lot of the interior work didn't get finished. They hadn't put the blackboards on the wall in many cases. They hadn't put the desks together. Uh, they hadn't put the covers over the radiators, the big metal coverings. Um, so about 30 or 40 of the students that were coming to Groveton for the first time spent their summer putting the school together. I'm Bo Lyons, 1959, and uh, enjoying the weekend. Uh, first with the golf outing on Friday, which was fantastic. We had a good time. A lot of guys I haven't seen for 30 years, 25 years, 20 years. I, I had a, a kind of a not the happiest kind of home life, and so I got involved in everything I could to stay at school until my father came home from work. So I was at the school every day till 5:30 or 6 o'clock. I was in the Latin club, the Cotillion club, the chorus, uh, student government. Uh, uh, forensics, uh, boys poetry recitation. I won the, the senior boys poetry recitation in 1959 for the whole county. And uh, it was just to be involved and, and do things and stay at school until dad came home from work. Then I would go home. That way I wouldn't fight with my mother. Groveton High School, in my opinion, was a true crossroads of civilization and what you were thrown out there to expect of uh, life because we had every imaginable group going to that school. My name is Bonnie Smith. I graduated from Groveton High School in 1968. My idol was Mr. Braden. Mr. Braden, Bobby Braden, 
got more kids that didn't have a chance in life, an education and a diploma, and taught them that being a good plumber, being a good car mechanic, refrigeration guy, auto body repair man, hairdresser, that's what I am. <laughs> he got a lot of kids through that wouldn't have ordinarily gotten through. I did like growth and I think it's the, uh, I think it just represented what all of the various classes, I mean from trailer courts to, uh, to Bell Haven, and we all went to school together. Uh, Linda Blair. I live in New York City and I'm in the class of 1965. Oh, 1960? I forgot! I'm looking at you and thinking you're reading 1965. I'm pretending. I'm much older than that. I'm from the class of 1960. Well, for people, I think it's the end of a... For women, for men too, but even more for women, the end of a whole period of their lives as uh, child bearers, as raising children. I doubt it. I, I think there's only a small number of women here who are full-time housewives. Uh, most women worked outside of the home. Uh, but Radical change. That's a big change from our mothers. We're the first generation for whom that is just universally true. But now they're heading into another period of their lives of their 50s. And some people I met are retired. People have grandchildren. And this is a period of time that when we were growing up seemed unimaginable beyond the pale that you could you would be dead by then but we're not dead in fact everybody looks terrific <laughs> Linda's considerable talents as a New York journalist were first honed at Groveton where she participated as a sophomore in the newspaper club activities were important at Groveton they gave us an early identity and some early guidance in 1956, I was Betty Holstein. In 1959, I married the football coaches, and I became Betty Tabor. I am still Betty Tabor. I was the choir director at Grofton High School from 1956 to 1962. I have had so many of these people come up and thank me for the music that they've always had in their lives. And I said to somebody tonight, maybe this sounds kind of morbid, but I think if I die tomorrow, the memories I have with these people at Groveton, the music that they made, the way it's lived with them, and the way they are today, I'd be happy. Some activities were extracurricular. Groveton's first principal, Emery Chesley, recalls one related to the competition with arch rival Mount Vernon High School. I recall our first year, I got a call from the other school and said, uh, Emory, you know, about this time of year, uh, some of the boys have uh, the habit of going down to Belleville and getting some bats out of those uh, uh, old barracks down there and turn them loose in the school. So I said, well, uh, can you name one person who might be involved? And uh, uh, I got one name. And of course, that immediately conjured up four or five others. So I called the... Uh, folks in and I said, now, what time are the bats supposed to be turned loose today? <laughs> and they laughed and said, they won't be turned loose. <laughs> they were in a locker, but they wouldn't be turned loose. And I think part of it was just simply saying, hey, uh, what time are we going to do this? We'll let everybody enjoy it. And so it kind of, what to work, spoiled the impact of turning them loose so we didn't have bat day. Groveton pranks continued in later decades like the 1965 incident when the German flag, symbolizing the stay of an exchange student, mysteriously disappeared, as recalled by a later principal, Rodney Taylor. We had a foreign exchange student here from Germany, and uh, in honor of his, his home, his, his country, we had this flag flying out here. And the flag disappeared, the West German Republic flag. And, uh, Mr. Jackson, my assistant principal, did a lot of arm twisting, and we found out the flag was somewhere in Bell Haven. I don't want to name the family or anything, but <laughs> it, um, it caused, uh, we did some suspending of students, and uh, it's interesting, there was a connection. You know, we were talking about, well, earlier about sororities and fraternities being illegal. Well, they were very much in a, 
in play here at that time a little bit. And um, they did uh, have the sit-in out here. So I can recall when the, the press was called and they were all around, my kids were sitting out in the lobby and Mr. Jackson and I were going around with pads and papers, taking down names. <laughs> Those, of course, are the viewpoints of the principals. There are also viewpoints of the students. Unfortunately, the BAT students have not been identified. Though they may have been attending the reunion, only they know if they're one or more of the upstanding middle-agers rocking and rolling here. However, the flag culprit not only came back for the Tiger Jubilee, he also provided his own surprising viewpoint of the 1965 incident. No, actually it was a conspiracy. To, uh, there's several of us 17-year-olds that had decided to overthrow Germany. And um, we were pissed off about the war still. And um, so we got the flag, and uh, that was the first step. We were mad about the end of the First World War. And, uh, and a uh, BMW that I had had. There was a lot of things involved, and we we just decided to do something, take a stand, and um, you know. Long story short, the absolute truth of it is, is there was a bunch of people involved, and I was the only one that got ratted on. And then they said, uh, "Well, rat on your coach conspirators," and I said, "No," and they said, "See ya." And my old man told me he was proud of me for not ratting. He said, I, I kicked my butt for getting kicked out, but he slapped me on the back for not ratting. So, you know, that's it, isn't it? I mean, you got to have honor, don't you? I mean, John Donovan, Durango, Colorado, class of 65. Groveton students were not unfamiliar with differing viewpoints. In fact, they remember... Project, Project viewpoint. viewpoint, right, um, where you start seeing bias in the media, or at least, you know, point of view in the media, was the first sort of time I really became aware of, of that side of even just receiving information, much less public policy making and that sort of thing. And that I've always remembered. I mean, that was one thing that stuck with me mm. of, of all the classes I took. My name is Jack L. Hiller. I taught at Groveton High School from 1959. Uh, in this building till 1977. I transferred to West Potomac High School when the building was moved in that direction and I taught there until 1988. Uh, I taught American history primarily. It was a, um, an assignment in which uh, students had to go to the media, uh, establish some kind of a criteria for what a liberal was and what a moderate was, what a conservative was, and then uh, by reading uh, a particular newspaper or magazine or listening to a particular um, commentator uh, or columnist, they would be able to attempt to classify his political philosophy based on um, the standard for what a liberal or a conservative was. And uh, it, apparently uh, it had a lasting effect on many of them. They began to think uh, politically. The, the project was... Um, it was a heavy burden, not only on them, it was a heavy burden on me because I had to grade all these things, but it, but it brought some of them uh, into a, uh, an exercise that involved a lot of writing and research on their part. And uh, some, have, I find out today, that uh, it uh, very much lives with them. Regardless of differing political viewpoints, the assassination of President John F. Kennedy on November 22, 1963, was a moment that seemed to freeze in the collective memory bank. This 1964 yearbook photo of JFK was taken by Mr. Hiller during the 1960 presidential campaign. Star athletes Dave Ringwalt and Jimmy Lewis pause here at a half-staff flag, symbolic of a turning point for the Groveton community and the country. Lots of changes took place. Some of them had been brewing for a long time, like the Civil Rights Movement there was not a black member of my class. And I don't think there were many blacks at Groveton until maybe 63, 64 with the change in the civil rights laws. Starting in 1960, Groveton helped break the color barrier in staunchly segregated Virginia and the rest of the South. Without fanfare, 